if you would turn in your Bibles back to uh, Hebrews chapter four, I'm sorry, chapter five. We'll read the first 10 verses together. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for himself and for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who is able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We thank God for his word. Uh, A couple things briefly for you by way of announcement. You may have heard uh, last week and this week uh, we have a a student retreat coming up the weekend of the 26th and 27th of February. It's a great place for a student and maybe if you're not uh, involved or plugged in yet and you'd like to be or if you have a friend that you'd like to invite along and you can find out more uh, on our website about that. Uh, Also, if you're a high school student this evening, uh, we have something called uh, The Gathering. Uh, It is just an opportunity after the service tonight uh, for high school students to hang out. It will be at one of the missionary houses on Root Road. And if you need uh, help with that, you can either go to parksidechurch.com forward slash HS groups for the address. Or uh, if you, is, is Robbie in here? Robbie, where are you? Yes, he's over there. So if you need directions, The guy, yep, glasses, hand, just go to him. All right, good. That'll work. Good. Well, would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to sing to you, um, that you give us the privilege of being able to come this evening and to rightly pause from all the things that are on our minds and in our calendars and, and going on, and that it's right for us just to, to stop and to be reminded that you are worthy of praise because you are glorious. Uh, we, we, we hope and we ask that we would be growing in our recognition of that, in, in better understanding who you are Uh, of why we would follow you and live for you. And and we pray even as we think about the opportunity and uh, the privilege to welcome in new members, we pray that increasingly as uh, a church that we would uh, give off the fragrance of Christ, Uh, that people would look and say, uh, I can't see why all these people would be together, so it must be that God is doing something. Uh, we just think about our world that, that aches for the good news of the gospel and for our friends and neighbors who uh, go through their days without hope. Um, even as we had the opportunity this morning to pray for the country of Thailand and uh, we, we flip on the TV and we see the Olympics in China and we see the, the, the effort to be united for a few days. And yet even in that country, the, the brokenness uh, the, the, the awfulness that we see. And so, Lord, we, we pray that we would uh, take advantages of the privileges that we enjoy uh, as Christians living in this country, uh, that it might cause us to pray for those who live in other places and have struggles that we don't know. 
Uh, and Lord, we pray increasingly that this would be a place where uh, the people who come here are welcomed warmly and, and find a place to uh, use their gifts to enjoy fellowship and accountability and all those uh, really rich one another's of scripture uh, and all because of Christ. Uh, we pray that we increasingly would be marked by uh, the, the Holy Spirit's uh, gifts in the, in the fruit of the Spirit and that we would take those with us wherever we go as uh, moms and dads and neighbors, uh, as, as those who have joys and as those who have struggles. Uh, and so we pray for those in our church family today that are struggling. It, it was our privilege to pray for some this morning, and so we pray again that, that in, in the way that we know that you are sympathetic to us, that, that we would be sympathetic to them, that we'd be moved by their trouble. Uh, and, and willing to, to help them and partner with them and pray for them. And, and Lord, as we uh, spend our time this evening, we cling to your word, uh, and we ask that you would help us, that we would grow this evening. Uh, what, what we pray for ourselves, we ask that you would, uh, by the power of the Spirit, make your word alive to us today, uh, that we might leave uh, more in awe of who you are, I'm more willing to uh, give our lives to you because you, the Lord Jesus, has given his life for us. And so we pray that you would help us this evening. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I've already read for us uh, that passage from, from Hebrews chapter five. This, this text presents uh, a question for us. Who do you want as your high priest? And so you've gotta make a decision. Uh, before our son was born, my wife and I recognized that we would need to buy a new car. Uh, even, as, even as we had uh, two little girls already, uh, we realized that having three children under three years of age, uh, which is, makes me just cringe thinking about it, um, <laughs> that her little car wouldn't fit three car seats side by side stacked together. Um, so we, we started a, a sort of pros and cons list of the options. Uh, the, in the, the pros list for what we had is it was paid for, but that was about the only thing that we could say that it fit in that category. Uh, one of the options for us was, was a minivan. Uh, and you should know that as a, a 16 year old kid, I had a, a poster of a Porsche 911 and a Ferrari F40. So saying I drive a minivan is, is a big cons category check mark. <laughs> but as, as we thought about it, um, the more and more we did our research, the more and more we went, I can, if I put this down on paper and I look at it objectively, I can rationalize this. And to everybody but my 16 year old self, the minivan made sense. It was, it was the right choice. Uh, buying, buying a car is not, uh, in some ways, is not a life-changing decision. Uh, but who you will pick as your high priest is. It is, it is, it is massive. It has eternal ramifications. And, and here in the book of Hebrews, in chapter five, we are presented with a comparison. Who do you want as your high priest? Who will you choose to mediate you, to represent you before God? Uh, this morning we began considering Jesus as our high priest. And this evening we'll see that the author uses these next 10 verses to compare the old high priests like Aaron to Jesus who is a new high priest of a new order entirely. In, in essence, to ask the question, why is Jesus a better high priest? Uh, the comparison happens in two main sections. If you look at chapter five, the first four verses describe the high priesthood of old. And then the next six verses describe the high priesthood of Jesus. And so in essence, these 10 verses say that Jesus is qualified and called by God to be his people's high priest. And he is superior in every way. If, if we're, you're trying to follow through, the author's gonna use sort of three categories to help us understand what the high priest office involves. 
And so we are gonna find out uh, the responsibilities of the high priest. Uh, we're also gonna find out uh, the, the way that the high priest relates to the people. And then lastly, how the high priest is appointed. So uh, the responsibilities, the relationship, and the appointment. And we begin in these first four verses by looking at the old order of high priest, like those of Aaron. Verse one, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Uh, We are initially told about the responsibilities of the Old Testament high priest. And, And this is helpful because what you and I said this morning was we don't live in the sacrificial system, so it's it's not easy for us to to put ourselves in that world. Every single priest is chosen from among the people, and he represents them and, and he is to act on their behalf. There is, a, there is a sort of in-between nature to his work and a, and a vertical nature to his work that he presents offerings and sacrifices to God from the people. The focus on the priest's humanity here uh, continues in verses two and three as we're told about the way that the high priest relates with all of the people. Verse two tells us that he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Uh, so we find that the priest has solidarity with the people. The, the priest is, is like the people. And because he is like them, he can be and must be gentle with them. Uh, he knows what it's like to be weak. And because he knows what it's like to be weak, then he should be kind to others who are also weak. He's called to be gentle with the ignorant. Uh, those who commit sins of ignorance. Uh, they, they don't know what they're doing, and so they sin. He's called to be gentle with the wayward, those who wander away from the things of God. And the reason that he's called to be gentle is because he knows their plight. He knows their predicament. He is beset by the same kind of weakness as ignorant and wayward people. I would imagine that most of us don't use the word beset on a daily basis. And, and, and essentially, the essence of that word is that the high priest is troubled, he's harassed, he's plagued, he's diseased by weakness. The positive of that is that because he knows the trouble of being weak, he can be gentle with the people he represents. But there's also a negative to that. He knows the trouble of being weak, so negative, he must offer sacrifices for his own sin. That's verse three. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. So he offers for himself first what he then offers for the rest of the people. And so it means that the high priests of old had solidarity in sin. He could never say, I can't believe I have to make an offering for you, because he just had to do that for himself. When Aaron was ordained to the office of high priest, Leviticus 9 records what Moses tells him, that he is to make atonement for himself and for the people. So he is like them. He is not superhuman. He is not better than them. So the high priest is like the people, and he is not like God. Uh, When I told you about our kids already, when our daughters were born, they spent a couple of weeks in the NICU And during that time, uh, one of the Cleveland Cavs players, his daughter was uh, for a few rooms down from ours. Uh, When I I met him, the temptation is to think that he's not human, that he's superhuman, right? That he's he's not like me. And in some ways, you're right. uh, He does things that almost no one can do. And so people pay him millions of dollars to do it, which makes sense. But in the most important ways, he's just like me. He needs a home, he needs food, he needs air, he needs water, he needs all of that stuff that every other human being needs. And so in the most important way, that guy's just like me. And in the most important way, the high priest is just like the people. And so he is called to be gentle with the people. We, we have here a picture, uh, an appropriate analogy in the pastors of our church. 
that as pastors, we are called to be gentle with the people of the church because there is not a sermon that is preached that is meant for the people and not for the pastor. No pastor will ever stand behind this pulpit that will offer a Jesus or a gospel that he himself does not need. Every single pastor who preaches a sermon at Parkside here needs and is completely dependent upon the grace and mercy of God, just as every person who ever sits in any seat in this room. And so we are called to gentleness. There is one last thing here in this old order in verse four. How is the priest appointed? Verse four tells us that no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So the office of high priest is fulfilled by God's appointment. Israel does not have a democratic election. Uh, there, is, there is no sense where all the priests get together and they pick who they think is the best one and he will be their captain, and they'll, they'll set him to midfield at the beginning of the game. There, there's nothing like that here. So the priest is, is not selected as the best of all the people by the people, or the people saying this is who we really want. The, the high priest is chosen by God, and because of that, they are certain that God approves of this high priest. That gives us a, a sort of sense for the old order and all that's, in, all that's wrapped up into it. I think and I hope that you and I are growing in our appreciation of how much the high priest meant to God's people. They were utterly dependent upon him. They needed him. And so who he was mattered immensely. And I think too that we could say that there's something helpfully tangible about this old order. Uh, you, can, you can see him, you, you watch him, you see him make sacrifice, you watch him go into the temple, and so there is something visible and tangible and, and helpful about that. And so you can imagine how the, the people that received this, this letter were tempted to go back to the old, because in some ways it's, it's easier. You can see it, you can, it's tangible, you can touch it. And trusting Jesus by faith is, is faith. You don't, you know that Jesus has risen and alive, but I can't see him. Uh, scripture tells me that, that Jesus prays for me, but I don't watch him do that from heaven. And so I, I think we can appreciate this. And with all of that going on, these Christians are tempted to go back to the old, old priests, old systems, because it's easier to trust in things that you can touch and see and watch you and I probably are not tempted to go to an old sacrificial system, but we are placing our trust in something or someone. If we're honest, many of us live our lives as if we were our own high priest. So we bring our offerings of, of good deeds and good works and hard work, being a nice person, and we hope that that will be enough. Maybe you've banked your life on that and you will not easily be converted to trust in Christ. But it's good for you and I to remember that there are no self-appointments to the office of high priest, so I don't qualify and you don't qualify. There is only one high priest who has been appointed by God and his name is Jesus. So we have a choice. Either we consider Jesus or no one at all. When I was young, uh, America Online used to send out CDs with the latest update. Uh, for many of you in the room, you're too young and so you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, so just imagine iOS update. That's kind of the same thing. I, I remember they would come in the mail and my dad would be at work and I'd get the mail and more than anything, I just wanted to throw that thing in the computer and click install. Because when that disk says 6.0, it means that it's faster and better and in every way superior to the old one. You can imagine how frustrated I was when my dad would come home and he would wanna read everything in the booklet. <laughs> now to be fair to him, if the computer blew up, I wasn't paying for it. But I was quite happy to blindly click upgrade and see what happened. 
here in these last six verses of Hebrews, uh, our author is saying that Jesus is the great high priest of a new order and that he is better in every way. I think what's really encouraging here is that Hebrews does not call us to a blind faith, but a thoughtful, clear, informed faith. Because it has already told us that our life depends on Jesus. And now it's gonna tell us, here's why you can trust him. Here's why he is better in every way. Here's why you can trust him and why you should live for him. Because God has called him and he is the qualified, better high priest. And so Jesus is the high priest that's worthy of your and my complete faith. And he is the perfect high priest. So Jesus is the perfect high priest of a new order. That's our our last six verses here. We begin with an introduction again and we'll work through the same categories of the responsibilities and the relationship and the appointments and the author will do it in reverse order. We find out in verse five that Jesus the exalted one did not exalt himself to this office. Instead he was appointed by God the Father. It's incredible to think that Jesus doesn't seek his own glory. That's actually how he lived his whole life, with humility. And so he serves as high priest because he is appointed by the Father. This is not him grabbing at something, but the, the Father appointing him to this office. And so he serves, and just like the high priest of old, this position is not one of self exaltation. But we do find out that Jesus is qualified. And then we read two Old Testament quotations. Uh, The first one comes from Psalm 2, verse 7, which says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Psalm 2, 7 is not about priests. It is about kings. And Psalm 2 talks about the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior who will come, and he will rule as king. And those who take refuge underneath him will find safety. And maybe at this point you're like a student in a lecture and the professor has said something and it sounds like he has the wrong page of notes stuffed in and he just kept going. And so you go, I don't understand. And so hoping for clarity, you keep reading and you find another Old Testament reference. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I don't know about you, but Uh, For me, that didn't initially give me any more clarity. Right now, you are desperately hoping that the person next to you didn't say, oh, I get it, because then you feel feel stupid. Uh, But most of us are are just catching up uh, and and trying to figure out what in the world this means. Uh, Psalm 110 describes the coming Messiah and Savior who is both priest and king, and he belongs to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek is this really unique character and he appears for just three verses in Genesis 14. He is described as the king of Salem and the high priest of God. In in those verses, uh, Abraham has just won a battle and Melchizedek comes along and he blesses him and he offers him food and wine. Abraham then gives Melchizedek a, a tenth of everything that he has. That's what they would have done to, to the priests of old. So you, you go, well, what does Melchizedek have to do with Jesus here? Why is, why is this obscure figure brought to light? Oh, well, if you think about it, you go, well, Melchizedek is the priest that appears without known origin, and he doesn't belong to the order of Aaron. So he's not like Aaron. And Melchizedek fills the office of both priest and king. No one has ever seen an honor like that before. And Abraham ties 10% to him, which means that Melchizedek is great. And then all of a sudden, Melchizedek disappears from record, and we don't hear anything for a long time about him. So you go, okay, priest and king, worthy of never before seen honor. Who is like that? Hebrews says, Jesus is like that. And so our author for us, by bringing Melchizedek into it, says that 
Jesus belongs to an entirely new category, an entirely new order. And there is a completely different nature to his priesthood. So if you want to think about him, don't use Aaron. You're going to have to use somebody far more unusual like Melchizedek because the comparison to Aaron just doesn't work. As king, Jesus will crush his enemies and save his people. And as eternal high priest, he will represent you before God. So Jesus is qualified just like Aaron by his appointment, but he's greater because he is appointed as high priest and king forever. Our author goes on from the appointment to describe how Jesus relates to his people. In verses seven and eight we read, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from his death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So we already know that Jesus is, is qualified just like Aaron because he's appointed by God. But we find out that Jesus is also qualified because he can identify with the people. Just like Aaron, he has uh, solidarity with them. He can relate to them. Because he's flesh, he's human. And while Aaron had solidarity through sin, Jesus is sinless. And his solidarity, the way he relates, comes through suffering. So Jesus offers up prayers and supplications. Just like any other human being, Jesus is completely dependent upon God. He lives the life of a frail human. And if you and I are tempted to minimize the incarnation and say that, I don't, I don't really know if Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. These verses won't let us do that. Jesus becomes human and completely dependent. Also, he could qualify to be your high priest. We read here that he has loud cries and tears. It describes for us his prayers before God and his life experience of a man of sorrow. Jesus does not live a cushy life. Jesus did not escape the pain and the cries and the tears and the suffering of humanity. And so, if you have Jesus, then you have a God who knows your tears. This is a reminder to us of the utter uniqueness of Jesus. Because Buddha and Allah and the impersonal gods of money and power and romance None of those care about your pain. They don't know about your tears. They don't sympathize with you when you suffer. Only in Christ do we find out that there is a, a humble king who becomes man and he knows your sorrow and he does it so that he can intercede for you. It's, it's incredible. We hear the response of Jesus' prayers and we read that he was heard because of his reverence. Uh, even as the Son of God, he submits himself to the will of the Father. Uh, we, we hear one of his prayers uh, in Luke 22, and this is what Jesus says at the Mount of Olives when he's preparing to die on the cross. Jesus, in prayer, says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus was heard because of his reverence and his submission to God. And you and I know how the Father responds to him. Jesus is not delivered by escaping death. Jesus is only delivered through death and he willingly submits and goes to the cross. As you think about that, have you ever considered that the best thing that has ever happened to you happened because God said no to Jesus? I found that really comforting. Jesus was not spared the wrath of God, but you can be if you trust in him. 
And so sometimes when you and I pray and we really struggle because we don't get the answer that we want, we have a hard time knowing, why, God, why are you doing that? I don't understand what you're doing. And even when God says no to our prayers, the greatest evidence that he is working for our good is found in this. It means that even when God says no, he is trustworthy because he is working for our good. Verse eight tells us that although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. I think many sons have learned obedience through suffering. Uh, you, you might be one of them. But Jesus is no ordinary son. He's the eternal son of God. And so this is, this is hard to understand. What does it mean that Jesus learns obedience? Uh, I was helped by a commentator, uh, Kester, this week. He says this. To say that Jesus learned obedience does not mean that he was formerly disobedient any more than saying that he became a merciful and faithful high priest means that he was formerly callous or faithless. What in essence we're, we're saying here is that Jesus' obedience isn't theoretical and Jesus learns how to trust God by doing it and he does it every time. So Jesus becomes the perfect high priest through his suffering and perfect obedience, tested and tried and proved over and over again. And so we find out again that Jesus is, is qualified because he's been appointed by God to be our high priest and because he's human and he suffers like you do, but he is perfect. And that leads us to verses nine and 10, which uh, in essence mirror our first two verses that tell us about the responsibilities of the high priest. And being made perfect, this is verse nine. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The beginning of nine here continues what we were already saying in verse eight. Uh, being made perfect does not mean that Jesus was not perfect before this morally. What it means is that through his perfect obedience, he is made to be the perfect high priest for you. And so Jesus becomes the perfect high priest through his life and his death and his resurrection and his, essential, his ascension. All of those are essential to what it means for him to be your and my perfect high priest. And then we're told wonderfully here that because of all of that, that he becomes the source of eternal salvation. If you will believe in him, he offers eternal salvation for you. And this echoes back to our prior verses to say, who, who benefits from the good news of salvation in Jesus? And the answer is only those who believe it, only those who receive it. And we are told here that the good news of salvation only comes to those who believe and obey. There is no salvation apart from obedience. So I, I hope at this point, having looked at the old and looking at the new, that you and I see the contrast and that it becomes obvious to us. And nothing about the old order was perfect. These were imperfect high priests. They had to make sacrifices for themselves. These are imperfect high priests who year after year have to make sacrifice after sacrifice, and when they die, a new one must be appointed. I hope you can see that in every way Jesus is superior. He is the first and only perfect high priest. He makes one sacrifice his life, and he is appointed as the eternal high priest and king. He lives forever. So just like the priests of old, Jesus can relate to the people, but unlike the priests of old, Jesus can save the people. And so Jesus belongs to an entirely different order. And the author is willing to tell us a little more, but at the end he reminds us about Melchizedek. And essentially the point is clear you don't know anybody like Melchizedek because there's nobody else like him. And you don't know anybody else like Jesus because there's nobody else like him. Just like Aaron, he's appointed to his office and his responsibility and his appointment, but he is better in every single way. You, you might think through these comparisons and you've looked at the checklist and you've gone, there are 
There's nothing in the negative category when it comes to Jesus. He, he wins every comparison. He is better in every single way. But there is a cost. You and I can have a perfect high priest who offers eternal salvation, but we're reminded that we must obey him. Because he is priest and king, we must bow to him. So you cannot have Jesus as your high priest if he is not your Lord. If you will not, like the Lord Jesus, submit your life to the Father. And so if we would receive his benefits, we must bow to Jesus, we must obey Jesus, we must trust Jesus. And we're reminded again that Jesus has appointed one high priest. His name is Jesus and there is no one better than him and salvation is found in nobody else but him. And so it causes us to consider him again and say, will we, will we really trust him? Will we really give our lives to him? Will we believe in him? Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that you describe Jesus for us in ways that we can understand and even in some ways that are really hard to understand. And we thank you that tonight, even as we prepare for communion, that we have the reminder for us that Jesus' sacrifice is once for all and that there are no more. Uh, so it is either Jesus or nobody. We realize that that means that we will have to stop trusting in our good works or being nice or the things that we do. And we have to give all of that up. And that is not easy for us to do. So we pray that as, as these verses present us the glory of Jesus, that we would willingly consider all of that rubbish and that we would give our lives to him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.